me. I went where others failed to go and did what others failed to do. I asked nothing from those who gave nothing and I reluctantly accepted the thought of eternal loneliness should I fail. I have seen the face of terror, felt the stinging cold of fear and enjoyed the sweet taste of a moment's love. I have cried, pained and hoped but most of all, I have lived times others would say are best forgotten. At least someday I will be able to say that I was proud of what I was, a soldier. He called. <laughs> John Hamill, Thomas Kelly, Paddy Gettens, Liam Caffrey, Dennis Casey, Eamon Masterson, Paddy Kelly, Garda Gary Sheehan, Frank Moore, Joe O'Kane, Kieran Dowling, Seamus Doherty, Terry McCormack, Seamus Mannion, Peter Ward, Jonathan Campbell, Tommy Malloy, Joe McDonough, Gary Costello, Jerry Tiernan, Ronan McCormack, Adrian Gallagher, and Lou Tormey. Those that died since her last mass, Michael Ty, Dr. Jerry McDonough, Barney Reynolds, Jimmy McCown, Dan Mulligan, Jimmy Cribben, James Rice, and Seamus Furlong. Now, I was asked to give a bit of the history of the 4th Motor Squadron. As you can imagine, a lot of it, you couldn't tell it in public. So I'll do whatever I can. <laughs> Most of you here today have been there, you've done that, and you wore the T-shirt. But I have to say, I will just jog your memory. The 4th Motor Squadron was formed in Athlone on the 13th of June, 1940, under the command of Captain Thomas Marion. Later the same year, Boyle Barracks became the main HQ. From 1946 to 72, 
Plunkett Barracks was their home. After 26 years there, they moved to Longford, where they remained for 36 years. Their final move was back to their birthplace in Athlone. They remained there until the unit was stood down in 2012. I suppose what most soldiers remember most is the comrades they served alongside that were taken too soon. Lawrence Kavanagh was born in County Carlow. He enlisted in the army and served 12 years in the Cavalry Corps. The last five as a corporal in the 4th Motor Squadron. He died in the Korean War in 1951. Overseas duty cl claimed three lives. Two in road traffic accidents, Sergeant John Hamilton, Sar Sergeant John Hamill and Trooper Jonathan Campbell. And one, Corporal Peter Ward, was killed in action. Paddy Kelly and Garda Gary Sheehan were both killed on active service in our area of operations. Those that were serving with them have never forgotten their sacrifice. Eight others died while on operational duty. Seven died in other circumstances. The range is aged from 17 to 59. Each year this mass is held to remember all those young soldiers. During their years in the corps, the squadron were called on to perform many tasks, both military and civilian. And due to the expert training received from Commandant Stanley Woods, the unit was chosen to take over the escort of honour from the Blue Hussars in 1948. Lieutenant John Chadwick had the distinction of commanding the first ever Cal Motorcycle Escort of Honour on the 31st of July 1948. It was for the presentation of credentials by the Argentinian ambassador. The 4th Motor Squadron handed over the ceremonial role to the 2nd Motor Squadron in 1955. In June 1958, Ireland responded positively to the United Nations request for troops for an unarmed military observer mission in Lebanon. The first troops from the 4th Motor Squadron that served overseas were Trooper Lawrence Ellard from Bagnallstown, Trooper Michael Noonan from Torlis, Trooper Joseph Long, Wexford, and Corporal Tom Cho from Wexford. They have served with the 32nd Battalion. The men from the unit that served at Jadaville were Sergeant Coleman Chubby Geary and Trooper Patrick McCartan. From then on, the 4th Motor Squadron provided troops to every UN mission until the unit was disbanded in December 2012. In 1969, the outbreak of violence in Northern Ireland marked the start of an intense period of aid to the civil power by all elements of the Defence Forces, both PDF and the FCA. In early 1972, plans were underway to deploy Fort Motor Squadron back to the Western Command on a permanent basis. Sean Connolly Barracks, Longford, was to be their new home. On the 1st of June that year, a troop under the command of Lieutenant Old Borden moved out of the Curra and took up residence in Longford. On the 25th of July, the 6th Battalion Pipe Band led Commandant Roger McCarley and the remainder of the squadron through Longford and into Sean Connolly Barracks. Over the next 30 years, many incidents occurred. I have a few recalled here. Sir John Paget Burke, who was kidnapped by Harry Duggan and the Dalton Gang, was rescued by the 4th Motor Squadron in May of 1975. In March 1977, both members of the 6th Battalion and the squadron were involved in a shootout with four Republicans near Monidou, close to Swandland Bar. Three escaped over the border. The 4th, Kieran McMorrow, a former Irish guardsman was captured and detained. Over the year, year, six members of the unit were decorated for bravery in the face of hostile and aggressive action. Those were Corp Captain Arthur McGuinness, DSM Congo, September 1961. Sergeant George Shocknessy, DSM for Distinguished Service with the United Nations Force, 
in the Republic of Congo in 1961. Captain Roger McCarley, DSM Congo, 13th to the 17th of September 1961. Sergeant Thomas McGuire, DSM, and Sergeant James McCaffrey, DSM, for outstanding examples of unselfish behaviour, courage, and devotion to duty in various engagements in the Congo. In 1983, on April the 15th, Lieutenant Anthony Bracken was presented with the Military Medal for Gallantry by the Minister of Defence, Mr Paddy Cooney, at a parade in Connolly Barracks. The citation reads, for displaying outstanding initiative and exceptional bravery under heavy fire on the 8th of April 1980 at the village of Atiri, South Lebanon. He voluntarily leaving his position regardless for the safety of his own life, went to the aid of two injured comrades. The flash of the 4th Motor Squadron, or the crest, or the badge, was designed by a young Carlo man. William Goshi Garman designed it in 1973. Now, when you join the army without having previous military experience, like myself, I was never in the FCA or anything, the orders, commands and military jargon can be confusing. You hear phrases like, hurry up and wait, shut your mouth when you're talking to me, and from now out you live in. <laughs> I would recommend anyone considering a life in the military to read Catch-22. It is the Ulysses of the military. It won't explain everything, but it will give you an inkling on how the military mind works. The older soldiers and NCOs in Longford, if you listened, they gave great advice to youngsters, never volunteer, improvise, and right or wrong, remain steady. Young soldiers who knew it all sometimes forgot these gems given to them by people with the wisdom of Solomon. Well, maybe not Solomon, he was married, he had a thousand wives, it mightn't have been that wise. But maybe Plato, Socrates, the Greek philosophers. The never volunteer was one you had to watch. On parade, you could be asked, is there anyone interested in sport? And you'd always get the lamb to put the hand up. And he ended up maybe washing and scrubbing out the gym and doing two or three days' work in the gym while he could have been thrown in turf just till half four in the evening. <laughs> or they could say to you, anyone interested in sport, you could end up washing cars. They might be sporty looking cars, but you could end up washing them. The one that always got me though was a friend of mine, he was sent to Spike Island in the early days there was plenty of trips to Spike Island from Longford. And this lad was sent to Spike Island. And on the first day there, this sergeant came out and he said, Lads, is there any drivers here? And my friend and another lad stood out and put up their hands. And the sergeant said, Good men, he said. There's two wheelbarrows there, he said. <laughs> There's a pile of sand there, he said, a mountain of it. It's to be shifted 200 yards. Get going. <laughs> I was at the gate one day in Longford. I remember this well. And there was an old sergeant on the gate. There was plenty of old sergeants in the FCA, and they had great wisdom. They knew everything because they had been in from the emergency. And a fairly new officer was on duty and he meant business. He asked the sergeant if he knew his orders, to which he replied he did. We thought that was the end of the matter. But the young lieutenant asked, what would the sergeant do if a submarine suddenly appeared at the Camden Bridge? Well, we knew that we had no submarine, so it must be an enemy one. The sergeant, without hesitation, replied he would blow it out of the water with a torpedo. Oh, very good, said the lieutenant. But where would you get the torpedo? He said, the same place as you got the submarine, sir. <laughs> now, I thought that was a good answer. <laughs> now, the Official Secrets Act and the Unofficial Secrets Act prevent me mentioning many more incidents 
that occurred in this area. Like hunting expeditions in the Glen, <laughs> and how an enterprising NCO handled an epidemic of USL during Operation Hedgehog in the mid-90s, and other happenings. Later today, more may be revealed. But as he used to say on the border, say not until you hear more. <laughs> Long threatening come at last, and the closure date for Sean Connolly Barracks Longford was finally decided. January the 29th was the day the troops marched out for the final time. The first warning signs of the abolishment of some units and the downgrading of custom barracks at Lone were beginning to appear. The 4th Cavalry Squadron and the 4th Western Brigade were stood down at a ceremony in custom barracks at Lone on November the 30th, 2012. From 1972 to 1988, the squadron, with the help of the 6th Infantry Battalion and 17th Battalion, patrolled a section of dangerous and hostile border between Bell Turbot and Black Lion. Ballyconnell, Swan the Bar, Derry Lane, Aha Lane, became very familiar to those troops. On at least three occasions, they stood strong when the threat of civil war was in the air. Three times in the last 50 years, they have stopped devastating diseases like foot and mouth, BSE, from destroying the Irish economy by sealing the border and preventing the movement of livestock. They have called, been called on frequently to fight fire, floods and terrorism. They have operated transport, power stations, prisons and numerous other vital installations. None of this could have been achieved without the support of their families and loved ones at home, of course. Every soldier that did a border patrol, a search, a cash or a quarry escort, prison duty or barrack duty, may rest assured that he or she helped to save lives during what was a horrific period in our country's history. They knew what they signed up for, they expected nothing, they were not disappointed, for nothing was offered. But their intervention made this pleasant green land a safer area for their children, grandchildren and generations to come. The people of all of Ireland owe a huge step of gratitude to those who unselfishly gave their time to make it, this island a safer place for all. What is both wonderful and amazing to see is that so many of them are still giving generously of their time in the different military associations. I hope you all enjoy the remainder of the day and catch up with old friends and colleagues. Thank you.